Hello everyone and welcome back to Storytime on the NPC Dungeon Podcast. Every other episode I give DM and GM advice for people who are running or who are interested in running tabletop RPG games of their own. And on every other episode I tell a story from a game that I've run or played in in the past. This one came from the same campaign that Under the Tower of the Necromancer and Lookalikes came from. Those are both stories that I've told on this podcast in the past and if you're wondering why I so often pull from that campaign it's because it's one of my favorites and it's more recent so it's fresher in my mind. As always, if you haven't checked out those stories, feel free to. You don't need to have heard them to understand this one or anything, but they're still pretty entertaining in my opinion. I will say, however, that this one did come after Under the Tower of the Necromancer, and it did come after Lookalike, so there are some spoilers here for those episodes, and if you're okay with that, feel free to keep listening, but if not, feel free to listen to those first. I also want to note that this episode is a little more echoey than usual, that's because I'm currently in the middle of moving, and the room that I'm recording in is almost completely empty, so I apologize, but there is probably a little bit of an echo. That being said, it'll also be just a little bit shorter, seeing that I am moving right now. Anyway, today's story is a little more chaotic than some of the stories I've told on the show in the past. It involves several different settings, a couple different encounters, and more than a few undead. So what happened? We return to our friends, Thane, the Blackguard Paladin, and of course Harold Bigsby. Since Jack fell in a previous encounter, his sister Rose had joined the party. She'd been searching for her brother after he'd been separated at a young age and forced to join a mercenary group that the player who played those characters come up with, and ended up reaching the end of the trail that she'd been searching for him on a little late. Additionally, the Bard Shadow Dancer, remember this was played in 3.5 back when Shadow Dancer was a prestige class, not a monk subclass as it is nowadays in 5e, whose name was Amaros the Amorous, again an amazing name, will be tagging along in the store as he was present for the sessions I'm stitching together to make this story. This story begins really as all stories should begin in my opinion, and that is with a flying ship. My players had escaped the swamp of the necromancer, met up with that same muscular kobold they met in lookalikes, and set sail along a river leading to a nearby city and a small sailboat that this same kobold had made after wandering the wilderness alone. I'll definitely be telling his story later, so look out for that. They decided to cast a levitation spell on the boat as a way of being flashy and making a bit of a grand entrance, and as I'd already said, Amaros had a few levels in Shadow Dancer, so he was able to summon a shadow to fight for him. A bard who can summon an ethereal shadow being always makes for some fun hijinks, and this situation was no different. He'd even named him, and the name he gave him was Lemuries. Just for fun, he had Lemuries form a shadowy illusion of an even bigger ship made of shadow flying next to theirs with several other Lemuries clones acting as the crew. It was completely unnecessary, and we played it off as Lemuries just showing off and having fun, and I absolutely allowed it because I thought it was hilarious and it didn't affect the story of the game or anything. In this way, they traveled until they actually saw the city, if you could even call it such a thing. The buildings had all but crumbled and were decrepit and covered in vines and foliage of the countless plants and wildlife that taken refuge here after the city's apparent collapse. But what led to such a collapse? The party was determined to find out. As a result, they landed just outside the city to collect their thoughts. However, no sooner had they landed, did they come across a small encampment, no, a settlement, in the plains surrounding the fallen city. Running pretty low on supplies, the group began discussing whether or not they should go in and see if these people had anything they could perhaps purchase. We could storm their walls and intimidate them with our might and power into handing over everything they own, Thane said. Or, said Amaros, trying to remember why they still kept Thane around, I could go in and talk to them, you know, like people do. I do have a way with people, you know. Thane grunted and plopped himself down on the side of the boat, nearly tipping it over with his weight as Amaros looked over his shoulder. Hey, the bard added, where'd Harold run off to? A loud burst of shattering stone followed by an ear-piercing scream sounded from behind him, so he spun around to see Harold Bixby about 15 feet tall and lumbering through the settlement carrying a wand he'd apparently found earlier that apparently did just this. Amaros wasn't even surprised. He shook his head, nodded at Thane. This won't take long, he said, as he cast a quick dimension door spell, stepped through it, and emerged in the middle of the small settlement as several grasping vines wrapped themselves around the giant herald. Amaros looked over and around, tried to find out where those vines were coming from, and found no one. That was until he looked down and saw several little gnomes with their arms outstretched at a struggling herald Bixby. Sorry, said Amaros, he doesn't represent us. We just flew in, you see, and wait, you flew? And before Amaros could say anything else, a little old man shuffled into the fray from the crowd of gathering gnomes and waved them off. That was you? On the ship? Of course, said Amaros. Why? Amaros leaned back and listened to their story, never one to reject praise. 
As it turned out, these gnomes were once part of a larger nomadic tribe of gnomes that took up residence in the city after it had become overrun by nature. They were kicked out after the rest of them fell under the effect of some dark enchantment. Dark enchantment, you say, Amoros mused, thinking back to the man in the underground market mentioned in lookalikes, and the necromancer's tower they just left, beginning to put the pieces together. Yes, continued the old gnome. And we have an old prophecy recorded many years ago that a ship from the sky will descend and take us back home. If you could go in, find them, and bring them back to themselves, you'd be in your debt. Of course we'll do it, said Amaros, perhaps a little too enthusiastically as Harold groaned from behind him, mourning his opportunity to pass as a god. All right, said Thane as he strode through the rubble. Where to next? made off for the city and stepped inside its walls. The intricate calls of exotic birds filled their ears as strange creatures scurried underfoot. They rode through the city, enjoying the sights from the back of a massive migrating reptilian creature that had cut a path straight through the middle of the city, and trekked across the rooftops until they could see the glint of civilization remaining in the very center of the city. They knew that was where they had to go. However, there was also what appeared to be an old cemetery and a walled-off cluster of buildings inhabited by what looked to be a bunch of little gnomes. My players, doing what players do best, decided to become distracted by a side quest and book it for the cemetery of all places. On the way, they very nearly died, encroaching on the camp of the newest party member Rose and her pet philosopher named Maurice. Yeah, this one got a little weird in parts, but that's the fun of this game after all, isn't it? They had set off almost all the traps she had looted around the area she was sleeping in, but I'll tell that story on a future episode. I can even begin to do justice if I tried to fit it into this one. After greeting their new member, Amaros called for their old friend, the massive reptilian monster, and they made it for the cemetery. Alright, said Rose, her voice a clear ringing deadpan. Remind me why I'm with you guys again. We're here. Now what? Now we plan, said Amoros. I always think better in cemeteries, don't you? Agreed, said Thane. That's disturbing, said Rose before glancing over her shoulder and rolling her eyes. And so is that. What's he doing? Thane asked, following Rose's gaze until his eyes landed on the happiest Harold Bixby he'd ever seen. The man was grinning ear to ear and digging a shovel he'd found from somewhere nearby into the ground as he proceeded to rob the graves buried here. Anyway. Way, said Amaro, so as they began discussing their plans for the following days. However, just behind them and just out of sight, three ghouls leapt up from the ground to attack Harold as night fell. Only his shouts alerted the party to his peril. I'm sure you can imagine just how fun that scene was to narrate. So they turned to him and collectively rolled their eyes as Rose summoned her druidic magic and caused vines and plants to sprout from the ground and hold the ghouls in place. She used more of her magic to speak with those plants and vines and instruct them to leave the party alone. All except for Harold, of course, who was pinned to the ground by two of these ghouls, just out of reach of their snapping jaws. Thane threw his arm out in a dramatic gesture, commanding his cloaker to detach from his back, fly toward one, lift it into the air, and drop it to the ground as Lemuries reached his shadowy hands into another to drain its life away. Harold, finally able to stand, stumbled toward another through the carnage caused by his friend's companions. He, who was able to steal anything that wasn't nailed down, realized there was one thing he couldn't steal, and that was the companions, the little buddies like his friends had that followed them around that he didn't have. Filled with jealousy, he pointed to one of the ones remaining, the only one remaining, looked up at it and said, you, you're with me. It cocked its head, shrugged, and surprisingly began trudging toward him until a rose's velociraptor swooped in and sank his teeth into it. Well, he can't be here much longer, said Amaros, his voice far more monotone than usual. Are you alright? Thane asked, pointing to a bite mark that had been embedded into Amaros' shoulder. I'm fine, Amaros said before passing out and falling to the ground below him. He awoke, still in a bit of a hazy delirium, in the tent of the old gnome they met before. He'd cured Amaro so the disease from tractors from the ghouls they fought after the rest of the party dragged him there. Well, said the old man, did you do it yet? No, said Amaro, grinning and shaking his head even more broadly than Harold was earlier. I think you would have learned from this past encounter where a good side quest could land you, but he was just happy to be alive. He looked up, just ever so slightly more gone than usual, but never lost his usual smirk, and much to the chagrin of the rest of the party, he said, but we think we know where they are. I hope this one was just as entertaining to listen to as it was to run, and I hope I stitch it together well enough. As I said, it did take place over the course of a couple of different sessions. I know I did say that this one was going to end up being a bit of a short one, but don't worry, I definitely do intend to tell other stories from this part of the campaign on future episodes. Join me next Friday where I'll talk about things from a player's perspective and give a few pointers on how to help your GM and how to help your game run a little more smoothly as a player. You can listen to it pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts and via the NPC Dungeon YouTube channel. Until next time, let's learn something.